Hey everybody, it's Tyler Tapper and we are doing that perennial woodworker's favorite, the cutting board. You will have to excuse me because as you can see, this probably isn't going to turn out to be an end grain cutting board, so it's probably going to ruin all my knives and dull everything horribly, but I think we'll live through it. As per usual at this point, I don't really have a plan for the project, but a good place to start seemed to be to cut this in half. I did want to put that piece of wenge going straight down the middle of it, so marking out the center point, drawing a reference line, and then ripping it on the table saw. So for a while I'd been resisting the idea of doing a cutting board because I don't have the tools that make doing a cutting board relatively speaking easy. I don't have a thickness planer, I don't have a joiner, I don't have a drum sander. So as such, it's a little bit of extra work for me because I'm going to have to do a lot more sanding. I'm also making sure that all the wood and the lumber that I pick is the same thickness, relative, about the same thickness, so I'm not going to have that much sanding to do when I finish it up. The tool I'm using here is a biscuit joiner, and this is one of those gems of Harbor Freight. I don't think you need to pay a lot of money for a good one. Uh, this one served me really well over the years. A lot of times with cutting boards, people will just make sure that the surfaces are really flat and even and just glue them straight together without any kind of joinery in the middle of them. I wanted to have a little bit of extra assurance on this because I knew that the joints weren't going to be extremely tight because I was using a table saw and sanding. Um, also the grain is all over the place. Usually you want to make sure that the grain is all going the same direction. So especially with the cutting board where it gets wet, it's going to grow and shrink in the same direction. A lot of times if you don't take that into account, uh, you will get cracking down the road. I haven't with this and I think part of it's partially due to using all these biscuit joints in there so you get a lot more glue surface area and a lot more strength from it stretching and moving around. With the looser not perfect joints I was talking about in there, this is that old adage where you can never have too many clamps really holds true. You can really bend out a lot of the tiny little imperfections if you use enough clamps and enough force on these so I always try and try and do overkill with it. With the glue dried, it's time to true up all of the edges on here. Uh, I made, spent a lot of time on the sled making sure it was right at 90 degrees so it can cut pretty accurately. So I'm going around all of the edges and making sure it's a perfect square. And then looking at it, I figured why not cut it at a diagonal down the middle? It just barely fit in the sled and I figured I could do something cool with the design with that. Rummaged around in the scrap wood section, I had found these pieces of koa that I had actually found were thrown out of a shop when I was in Hawaii quite a few years back and they've been floating around. They were the right thickness for this, so I decided to go ahead and use them for a little accent. Putting them on these here, gluing them in between there. I thought this was going to be a relatively easy glue up, but this was one of those glue ups that just did not go right. Uh, so I figured I'd clamp it down to a board that'd give it pressure on the bottom and the top. I figured the clamp would ride on there. I couldn't get it to work. A good trick if you can't, for irregular surfaces, if you can't get a clamp to work is to just use a bunch of electrical tape. Turns out this is a really good way to use up crap electrical tape that's not very sticky because it doesn't have to be to be a clamp for wood. Uh, there's a lot of stretch to it still, so if you wrap it tight around there, uh, you can get a lot of clamping force out of it. You don't want to wrap too many times around there. You want to make sure there's airflow in there so it'll dry, but other than that, it works like a charm. Didn't wait overnight for this to dry. Didn't really have to. I just needed it to set up well enough so I could move on to the next step. Uh, Apparently, looking back at the video, baby wearing was helpful for that. And yes, before you freak out, I did take them off before I started using the table saw. When I was messing around with the pieces, I thought it would be pretty cool to put them back together so that center stripe was misaligned, so it was offset to each other. Um, so that's what I was doing, is I was cutting off those tips there so I knew exactly where to align it. Also, every opportunity I had, I came back and I thinned down the coal wood, I thinned down pieces of wood so I would have less sanding to do at the end so everything would fit together a little bit tighter. On to more biscuit joining. Couldn't figure out why it didn't work. Turns out plugging in is helpful. Other than keeping it plugged in, the only thing you kind of have to keep in mind is that you set the depth of these biscuits, so you want to make sure that it's always on the same plane, um, that the bottom is going to be the bottom on each side, so it's not offset top to bottom at all. Made that mistake one time where I had 
was kind of far into a project and I didn't have it completely centered in the middle of the board and I had one of the pieces flipped over, went to put it back together and there was a step in there and man that really ruins your day. Anytime you have a diagonal glue up it's a little bit tricky. Put a little bit of pressure on it in two directions like that and then you can start really clamping stuff down. You just got to make sure that it can't grow and slide on itself. After that glue joint was good and dry, it was back to the table saw, back to the sled, so I can get a bunch of those 90 degree angles and turn this into a perfect box again. Checking it with a square because it's going to start becoming pretty critical as I lay things around the perimeter of this that everything's at 90 degrees. This is a close look at the surface finish. It's amazing how much sanding this is going to take to make it exactly flush. For the perimeter, I found this bird's eye maple that was at the right thickness. Uh, I had a little bit of routing on the edge of it. I was using it for another project where it didn't quite work out. So I set it to uh, the exact thickness that I want to make it and start running it through, ripping it down the table saw. All that texture you see on the edge there isn't going to matter because I know I'm going to route over the edges and that stuff will route out. Um, I just have to make sure that I point it towards the outside of the board when I'm going at it. When I'm buying lumber, I know a lot of people try and look for as perfect of lumber as they can find. A lot of times what I gravitate towards, because I like how it looks in the finished project, is stuff with, that's a little bit rougher like that. Uh, when there's tear out like that, it seems like you kind of get some kind of cool variations in the grain of it. Um, and I like that in the finished product. I don't like it to look super uniform. After I got that maple cut, I realized that I had a bunch more of this koa wood and I thought that it would be kind of cool to do one extra frame around it for one more one more layer on it. So did the one side, glued it, let it dry, cut the ends flush with it, and then got the other side glued on there. So just like before, so I can save myself with sanding, I'm taking off the tall edges and getting it pretty flush with a hand plane just to save myself some work later. And honestly, just making all these shavings is so much more gratifying than using an orbital sander. So I came back and trimmed everything off, made sure all those corners were at 90 degrees, made sure there was no overhang so it would create gaps. Uh, you can see I used that chisel to make really exact marks on where I needed the table saw to cut it. Throughout this project, I don't think I used a tape measure once on it. I was just doing all of the measurements relative and off of the pieces I'm working with. and. I don't know, I find a lot of times when I do that, it's a lot easier for me not to make errors because there's an extra step and if something's one and a half inches and then you go there, you have to measure the piece, make sure that you're measuring it accurately, then measure where you're putting it, measure where you're cutting it. If you just reference it off of the piece that, that you're working with, there's just kind of one less thing in between there I've found. Now, of course, there's projects where that won't work. There's sometimes where you need to fit something into a place in the environment if you're making a cabinet or something like that. But with a cutting board, it's you're laying it on the counter and nobody's going to know whether it's 12 inches or 12 and a half inches, or, but they are going to look at how everything lines up and how everything looks to the eye. So that's the important part. So we're finally getting to the final glue up and the final biscuit joining. Uh, every time I use the biscuit joiner, I always make sure to pre-assemble these. It can be a little bit tedious, but you do find a lot of errors in your work or maybe a lot of things that maybe there's a little bit of sawdust stuck in one of these holes. And if you throw glue on there and you start trying to just throw it right together the first time, inevitably something won't line up and you'll have to go back and wipe everything out. And it's, it's just better to pre-assemble it just to make sure everything fits. You might be wondering why I left those boards long on the end. It was because I, at this point I still thought I might be able to make it over to a friend's place before I finished this to run it through a planer. I wasn't able to, but I figured that if I had those runners on it, it might help with snipe on the end of it. So I'm using this thick piece of walnut on the bottom for two reasons. First reason is, again, I like to tie everything together with all those grains going all those different directions and the moisture that's going to be inherent in the cutting board. I wanted something to stabilize it. I think this might be another reason why I haven't had any issues with that. And the other side of it is it just looks more substantial when it has that extra thickness to it. To help with that feel in the hand, I'm going to route all of the edges over. I'm just doing a 45 degree along the bottom. I always like doing this when something's going to be sitting against something because it makes it look like it's floating a little bit. So when it's on the counter, it gives it a sense of depth. 
for the top because I had that one piece where it had that uh, knock out of the gray and I didn't need to round it over. Kind of wanted to anyway just so it felt a little bit better. Um, but I'm coming over here with a round over bit and not doing it as aggressively as I did on the bottom. Another cool thing about using a round over bit on curly maple is it really exposes the kind of depth of that curl. Sure, you can see how excited I am for even more sanding off camera to get everything into level on both the top and the bottom before I glued it. I used a belt sander and then I came up with the orbital um, up through 80, 120, 220, uh, 420, and I think I went all the way up to 600 with it. So all the pain of the sanding is instantly forgotten when you start putting the finish on there. Uh, for this one, since it's going to be in contact with food, using a food safe uh, Watco Butcher's Block oil, it's a finish that you can, after you use a little bit, you can do a quick sanding over it and reapply it if you need to. In a couple of years since I've made this, we honestly haven't used this one a whole lot, but the finish has held up really well. So one thing that I still haven't done to this board that I need to is they make these little feet that are silicone and they will screw into the bottom of the board. Um, they aren't just the stick on ones, so they're really durable and stay on there and they'll raise it up off the counter so you don't have to worry about water pooling and sitting underneath it. Although I've put out other videos just because of the order in which I edited them, this actually was my first stab at a cutting board. Uh, I think it turned out pretty well. I would like to try an end grain one at some point in time and explore it more, especially if I get some more tools to make it a little easier. So I thank you guys so much for taking the time out to watch my video. As always, like, subscribe. If you know anybody that would like this video, share it. That really helps me out, and I will see you guys next time. Hey everybody, I want to let you know that I'm starting up a Patreon campaign. Uh, if you guys are feeling generous, I'd love it if you'd check down in the description. There's a link down in there to my Patreon page where you can donate. Otherwise, I really appreciate your continued support just by watching the videos. Thank you.